Welcome into another edition of the Hang Time Podcast. Hey, Coop Smith here in Atlanta. My main man, John Schumann, is in New Jersey. John Hart's behind the glass. A jam-packed show for you here today. Conference semifinals are on the immediate horizon. Getting ready to tip off this weekend. Shu, before we get there, though, a little bit of business still needing to be done. A couple teams have not kicked the door down just yet to get there. The Warriors, surprisingly, still in a first-round series. Denver and San Antonio still scrapping it out as well in a Western Conference first-round series. But the Rockets punched that ticket, and the Portland Trailblazers, Damian Lillard, Punch the ticket. The East teams punch the tickets. Later in the show, we'll talk Sixers and Raptors in that Eastern Conference semifinal with Michael Grange of Sportsnet in Toronto. Good dude. Good friend. Um, somebody we probably should have talked to a long time ago. Shoot. First, tell me what your immediate reaction was when Dame Lillard hit a 37-footer to eliminate the Thunder and then wave bye to him. He's a bad man. Like he is, <laughs> it's, it's, that was that's a moment. Like that's a moment I don't think we'll ever forget. I would love to know like what that feeling is like. It's got to be pretty freaking incredible. Mm-hmm. Um, you know the whole the whole package. Just you know them coming back from fifteen down. Paul George being the guy defending him, you know, one of the best yeah. perimeter defenders in the league. Russell Westbrook, no way around him, by the way. Yeah, when yeah. I mean, Oklahoma City not trying to get the ball out of his hands, even though, I mean, he never got, like, anywhere close to the three-point line. No. Um, and, you know, it's been said that, you know, he's hit, he's hit a lot of 30-footers in this series, but that was a step back. Like, it, that, that's much a much more difficult shot than walking into a 30-footer, right? Yes. Like, a, a, a standard pull-up like he did say on the first shot of the series where he just sort of walked into a, a 31 footer or whatever it was. 37 footer with time expiring to, yeah. to cap off a 50 point night shoe. Incredible. And win a series at the buzzer. Does that change the way you think we'll look at Damian Lillard? And I know it's just one shot, but it's an iconic shot. And now he's got two of them and he's on a short list of guys along with Michael Jordan who have a couple shots like that in their career. Does our image of Dame Lillard change depending on that shot and what else Portland can get done in this playoffs? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I that, that absolutely um, affects how we think of him historically, you know, sure. I mean, that's it. I mean, it's two huge shots like that, the guy, and you know, we, we always have sort of selective memory when it comes to clutch clutchness in, in right. the NBA, you know um, you know, the stats can tell us one thing like that, you know, Kobe was just a sort of an average shooter in the clutch or maybe a little bit below average shooter in the clutch he just shot so mm-hmm. often and we remember the the ones that went in but I, I think yeah I mean the dude put uh his team on his back uh practically um I did I, I do think like you know give CJ McCollum a ton of credit he hit it he hit it like I think three big buckets in that comeback yeah. at least uh and he was struggling stretch. and still and still found a way to make those plays yeah I mean he hit some gutsy shots too just sort of stepping into contested pull-ups you know uh in, in the final couple of minutes. So, um, but yeah, I, I think Willard is, is building a le- legacy right here and he's still going. Um, and the Blazers shoot, have a chance to get to the conference finals for sure. You know, we've, we've said, you know, that side of the bracket is wide open and yeah. uh, why not Portland? You know, they certainly looked good enough in the first round um, that to, to, you know, they look good enough to win another one. Um a little dig, little dig by you at, at Russell Westbrook right there. Unintentional. I like it. Why not, why not the Thunder shoe? They've won four <laughs> playoff games since Kevin Durant left. Four. Not series. Games. I mean, it, 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 we're talking about in Russ, uh, an all-time great talent, a guy who's averaged a triple-double three straight years. And they, I mean, they literally can't get out of the first round in the playoffs. We're going to saddle Russ with a lot of responsibility there. But to me, when do we start talking about Sam Presti and and the organization and just the fact that for all the great things he's done, there there have been enough mishaps that they're stuck now as a team with the third highest payroll in the league, Shoe, and they can't make it out of the first round of the playoffs. It's all worth examining, you know, basically from, you know, where they were – in 2012 with Westbrook, Durant, Harden, and Ibaka to where they've arrived now. Um, and obviously they lost to, a, you know, if you just look at the, the guys that have won MVPs uh, from that 
original core, you know, they, they lost the two better ones, right? right. Yeah. And um, they retained the more flawed one. So you can go back all the way to the hardened trade, really, to see where, you know, some of the decision making started to fall apart. And you know what? I mean, it's part on Westbrook and, and the p- type of player that he is. And it's also on, I think, the organization as a whole just for enabling yeah. him to um, to be that kind of player and not helping him figure out um, how he can get better and how he can um, make the most of, of the kind of player he is. Because, I mean, he's in the sort of same mold as a, a LeBron or a Giannis, a guy who attacks – and can make and and open up things for others where you want to build sort of a system around him. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think he's just less disciplined with his own shot selection than those other two guys. He's not as good a shooter to me as he should be at this stage of his career. I don't mean we talked about this last time, right? Like, like why can't he be a better shooter? Or if, if he's not like, then just stop taking, or at least, cut out the the pull-up two-pointers, you know? Yeah. If you're going to pu- shoot pull-ups, just make them from three and not from two and just don't shoot, pull up anything outside the paint and inside the three-point line off the dribble unless, you know, there's only a couple seconds left on the shot clock. Like, just cut that out of your, your diet and you'll be a little bit more efficient player. Like, yeah. It's just, I mean, it's like I said, I just think it's time to start looking at how you're going to plot your way out of it if you're Sam Presti because you, you've done a great job surviving the loss of these other guys just to be here. But now you got to figure out some sort of plan. I mean, Paul George and Russ being in the primes of their careers, you hate to see them as a team that that's underachieving, you know, based on their talent and unable to get a scratch, you know, in the first round of the playoffs. Um, I've been asking you a question, Shu, for months. And you've been, sh- you've been shutting me down every time I ask it. You know, like, oh, don't worry about it. I don't know. Oh, they'll be fine. I no, want to wait till the playoffs. Uh, <laughs> the Cl- Lou Williams and the Clippers are not messing around, Shu. He got everything he wanted in game five. A 129-121 Clippers win to extend that series. Game six is Friday night at 10 o'clock. Ruining people's Friday night, Shu. So they, they're going to have to watch another game of the Warriors and Clippers to see if the Warriors are going to sleepwalk through it as a group. Or if they're going to be engaged and run, you know, and and play the way we know they can, they couldn't stop Lou Williams and Montrez Harrell with with police escorts last night. It was ridiculous. I mean, they came all the way back, right? They took the lead late, and then you and, know, it's just and still, matter, yeah. hey, let's just get like, hey, two more stops and we're good. But they just never got those stops. Lou Williams just got buckets down the stretch. I mean, he had some tough shots, but at the same time, you know, yeah, there was too much of Harold getting sort of clean rolls to the basket without no contest. Nobody did uh, yeah, the no. necessary help from the weak side. Um, there was one where he caught the ball and just sort of looked Clay Thompson off and Clay Thompson ran away and Harold had a, an easy dunk. There was one, there was one play where it was a high pick and roll and Lou Williams had Bo getting up. I forget who the other defender was And Harold rolled to the basket. Might've been Draymond and, and Harold like he spun and rolled to the basket. He looked shocked. <laughs> the, the, like if you go back and look at the replay, he had a, you know, and he screamed after he dunked, but he, he had a look on his face like, Oh, y'all really going to give me the lane again? Like a, a free run again. Yeah. That, I, don't, I don't get that. I don't get the Warriors being this lackadaisical on defense. I don't understand that. Yeah, they flipped the switch last year defensively. Um, I think I've said this before. Like they're basically like the number, the second best defense in the first round, and then the best defense in each and uh, each of the next three rounds. Yeah. Um, and if you look at the difference between the wins and losses in this series, it's on it's on the Clippers' end of the floor. Like the Warriors' offense has been consistent. And, yeah. you know, it's been different guys each night. Like Durant obviously had the big game in game five, but it's, you know, uh, in the three wins, they've allowed 95, 104 and 107 points per hundred possessions, which is all good, good defense below, yeah. you know, the league average. Right. Um, and then the two losses, 125 and 132. So that's, that's a lot. Right. And so it is on that end of the floor. And it's, what's crazy is it the two losses came at home. Like that's, that's the sort of amazing part of it, you know. No, it's not a man. This is exactly – you know what? <laughs> I'm going to make John go back and find all those clips out. Remember when they were getting – I kept bringing up the fact they were getting blown out at home this year during the regular season and how worried that I was about that? They What, they had eight or nine games during the regular season where they got licked by 20 at, at the house, at Oracle? That doesn't make sense. 
All right, I'm going to, I'm going to quickly look up what they were <laughs> at home in the last two postseasons. So postseason with Durant, the last two seasons, 19 and one. Come on, man. So they've already lost more games in this postseason at home than they they lost in the last two combined. It just, I mean, it literally does not make sense. Steph seemed off all night. Like, I noticed, like, you know, when Steph's having a bad game, sometimes he 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 won't look up. Like, he'll be walking around and he'll be running around and his he'll keep his head down. Like, like he's in his own head. I'm, I'm gonna ask you one more time: Are you worried at all about the Warriors? I'm a little bit more worried than I was a week yeah. ago. I'll say yeah. that. Um, I mean, and do you take the field versus the Warriors now at this point? Maybe. Um, and I mean, time, time will tell. Time will tell if this was just a blip on the radar or if this was the first, you know, the sign that this was the year that it, they don't win. Right. You know, like somebody brought up, hey, maybe this is a the 2011 Lakers, right? You know, like where this is the sign that, hey, this is, you know, this is not the year for them. Well, I mean, I even think back to uh, – I go back to the Miami teams that went to the finals four straight years. They were, you know, lose the first year to Dallas in a shocker, obviously. You went back to back. And then you you could have easily lost to San Antonio the first time, obviously. to lo- You know, and then to lose to them the way you did the second time, at least there was this sense that it was a fair fight, like, Miami, to me, Miami never looked like a team that was crumbling away, even though they were, even though the way they were built that last year, San Antonio exposed them in that final. It it was like a, it was a small step backward on defense that really did them in. And they just just got eviscerated in the finals. Um, But it was like, like that was the one year they didn't rank in the top 10 defensively. And exactly. I remember talking to Shane Battier after that game, after game five. And he's like, Yep, our defense. We just didn't have. We just didn't have build the same habits this year as we did, and and it showed. You know, they ranked eleventh. Like that's not terrible defensively, but like it was just a sign once a uh, 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 enough slippage that it it got it them cost them four championship. Yeah, and, I'm, and I'm, so I'm, the Warriors are the same. Like they finished eleventh yes. defensively, which is the same where they finished last year. But it's mm-hmm. still, still, it's like a little bit of slippage. It's not the same habits that they've had in the past. Um, you know, like, you know, I'm sure they drove Ron Adams crazy for most of the year. And now he's like, yep, I told you, you know, there's just a little bit of, a, I'm sure there's some, I told you so from them, from Ron Adams and some of their coaching staff that said, Hey, you know, we didn't build the habits defensively that we had, we've had in the past. Um, and it's coming back to bite us. You know? How do you, I mean, cause how do you get it back now? Like, how do you just magically repair that? I don't know that you can. I don't know if there's a team that can do it. It's this team. I think, you know, it's, it's the same core for the most part. Um, Draymond when he wants it is a phenomenal defender. So is Iguodala. So is Clay Thompson and Durant is obviously, obviously huge. He's not, you know, the consistent possession by possession, terrific defender, but he's, he's got the the tools. um, How how much of it is the Warriors and how much of it is the, the field? How much of it is the Clippers? How much, how much of it will be? Oh, give the, the Clippers a ton like of credit. Much, yeah, like you know, we're yeah. Not, yeah, we're not giving the Clippers enough credit here, like in this conversation so far. Yeah. So let's first give them their due for being a tough team. You know, one of the toughest eight seeds we've seen in a while. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, you know, a talented team offensively and a resilient team. Like you get your on the road for Game Five at Golden State. Like you know, uh, we saw. We saw a couple of Eastern Conference teams just get hammered uh, in Game Five on the road, down three-one, uh, a couple of nights ago. So you know, give them a, a ton of credit first of all. And yes, it's a they're they're a tougher eight seed than than a, t- a typical eight seed. So maybe that's why the Warriors have lost two games. But you know, it doesn't bode well for what's coming next because the Rockets have been terrific. And it's not just that the Rockets have been great against other teams. You know, the Rockets have basically. Uh, you know, no team is uh, it's been really Western, good. Yeah. yeah, no Western Conference team has been more successful against the Warriors than the Rockets have over the last three years. You know, I was look, just because preparing for this series that's coming up. Um, Careful, looking ahead. No, no. In the in these three years with Durant, no team has a winning record against the Rockets, including including play. So regular season plus playoffs, no team has a winning record against. Excuse me, against the, the Warriors. Warriors. Yeah, Boston is three and three. Um, has been the best defensive team against Golden State over those mm-hmm. three years. 
uh, and the Rockets are nine and nine. So those they're, they're the two teams that are five hundred against right. Golden State over these three years. And so it's um, you know so it's not only that the Houston is really good and and has been playing well for the last couple of months. It's that Houston has had success against the relative success against the Warriors. Yeah, I, it just makes me think back to all those times where I got nervous during the season, and because <laughs> you know. I wasn't used to the Warriors getting blown out on their home floor the way they did. And then it happened again. And then it happened again. I thought this is un, this is an uncharacteristic thing for this team to deal with. But uh, we, we've noted all the drama they've had all season long. Not that that's a direct correlation, but just the fact that you, the slippage you talked about, you know, it, it, it won't manifest itself just in the way you play on the court. It's in the way you operate as a team. And, what it takes for you to get people, you know, kind of lined up and on the same page and on one accord. It's just a very delicate balance to to be able to perform at the level they have for so long now. And, you know, you think, well, five, you know, five years is not that long. Yes, it is. In the NBA, five years, shoe playing, you know, playing as deep into the playoffs as they have, that's an eternity. To, to have to perform at, at that elite level. And I'm just wondering if it's taken its toll finally on them as a bunch, as, a, as an entire group. I don't know. We'll see. I just want to know, if is it okay for me to be worried now? Do I have your permission? <laughs> Absolutely. Go right, for it. Just appreciate it. I just wanted to double check. They'll, they'll finish that up, as we mentioned. We'll, we'll see if, if the Clippers can make it a seven-game series. I'm not counting on it, but I'm not counting it out. You mentioned the East, shoot, and uh, and now that we can think about, you know, exactly what the matchups are in the East, it's a great time to uh, bring in our guest, Michael Grange of uh, Sportsnet in Toronto. And we see him all the time, uh, you know, at the finals or All-Star or whatever. We never get a chance to pick his brain here on the Hangtime Podcast, so it's good that we finally have uh, paid our phone bill and, and gotten a chance to make that international call. Um we won't keep you long. Just want to talk about the series, kind of get a gauge on what the mood is up there. You know, people are excited. I mean, the I think there's a little anxiety, as there always is, around playoff time in Raptor land. But once game two and three of, of that Magic series unfolded, and it was very clear who the better team was and how much this Raptors team was kind of improving almost quarter by quarter, game by game, the minute that Magic series was over and it was clear they were going to play in Philly. Uh, people are excited. I mean, this is kind of like a heavyweight type matchup. Mm-hmm. And unlike other years, you know, the Raptors and Raptors fans, I think, can reasonably feel like a favorite. And it's exciting. Like, there is a lot of stuff uh, laying ahead if they can figure out how to get by Philly. Does Kawhi provide that excitement, Mike? Just the fact that you know you have a guy like that on the roster now? Yeah, it's a it's a huge... You know, I don't know if in their previous, certainly not against LeBron ever, right. but not very often in the Raptors' 16 previous playoff series have they clearly had, I guess with Joel Embiid, I mean, definitely had um, a guy who could be easily the best player in almost any series they play, mm-hmm. who if he's not the best player in this series is along with Joel Embiid on like, you know, the shortest possible list of guys who can are in that category. And that's that's a new feeling. It's 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 calming, and you know. But I think there's a, also a recognition that there are other parts of this roster that are pretty special, and, and Marcus All might be very uh, close to the top of that list too. When they first traded for Leonard and Danny Green, I remember thinking, "Wow, look, think of like the defensive lineups that this team could put together." And then obviously they added uh, Marcus All, former Defensive Player of the Year at the deadline. And that just added to it. But I don't think we ever saw for like an extended period of time, not even like a five to eight game stretch, like elite defense from this team. And I think maybe we saw it in games two through five of the Orlando series. What have you seen sort of on that end of the floor? Um, What have they said about that end of the floor and how things have come together defensively for this team and, and, and how, you know, how good they can be defensively? Well, I think you're right. I mean, and it's funny, even before Adam Gasol coming out of training camp, this is a kind of a crazy anecdote, but they played the Pelicans in Montreal, Quebec <laughs> in a, in an exhibition series in the Pelicans. One of the games, the Pelicans actually brought their guys and 
And the Raptors rolled out Danny Green and Kawhi and Pascal Siakam and at the time OG Ananobi and Serge Ibaka. And you're like, wow. <laughs> you know, it was for about 10 minutes, it was like watching the Raptors play a grade eight team. Like they, <laughs> there was no, there's nowhere to go. Right. And you would see this lineup at very, or this, that kind of attention and, and, and potential at various times in the season, but it was fleeting. And it was interrupted often by Kawhi Leonard's load management. And, and to be perfectly frank, Kawhi Leonard did not play um, all NBA level defense very often this season, um, either by choice or design or. I'm going to interrupt um, you. There's, yeah. there's one possession that I frankly remember from middle of the season. <laughs> and I'm just going to go. He, he basically got back lazily on transition. It was like one of the last guys to get back on the, on the, uh, in, in, in transition sort of casually followed his man around a pin down screen. I forget who it was. That guy caught the ball, maybe gave him a half a second. Leonard caught up and then just snatched it from him. It was like, he was just so <laughs> casual about the whole thing for like 10 seconds. And then all of a sudden he's like, Oh, here you go. I'll take that. But yeah, yeah I, I, it's I, exactly what I like when you said that, that's exactly what I thought of. Yeah. And your point is a really good one, John, because I almost had felt like I had to come up with a new category, which is clutch defense. <laughs> for this guy because he would sort of drift around and at times you know he he got by on reputation a lot you see guys just kind of see him and give it up or see him and miss um which is part of being a good defensive player obviously but then the, it'd be worth actually digging into the film but there would probably be about five games where he won or tied or kept the lead in the final two minutes of a game with three points or less on defense and a couple of different occasions, he turned that steal or whatever it might be into a score at the other end. I mean, it, so it was clearly there. What you saw in games two through five um, was a, a much more engaged defender, and, and there's none better when he is. But also, um, you know, Marcus Gasol, his impact defensively in that series, and just kind of the emotion he plays with, the intelligence he plays with, um, and I think there was a moment at the end of game one, John, as you, and Seiko, as I'm sure you're very well aware, when DJ Augustine yeah. pulled up and hit the game winner. And it was a it was a, a, a very clear screw up by Kawhi Leonard. They were supposed to be uh, Kawhi was supposed to play over the over the screen. In fact, there were two screw ups by Kawhi. One, Danny Green was DJ Augustine's initial defender. They flipped him onto him in the second half of that game to cool him down. And Kawhi you know, switched on to DJ Augustine for no real reason. He just decided he wanted to cover the car, guard the ball. And then he didn't get over the screen and Clark Cascal thought he was, it was just a, a screw up. I mean, two elite players not knowing the plan and DJ Augustine burning them for it. And that was a, that I think was one of those moments where I think sure they got back into that room and in practice the next day and said, this is not happening again. And basically it has not. And it's been, uh, you know, four games now of, very, very high end defense with almost no lapses. And uh, I don't see why that would change uh, heading into the Sixers series. Yeah. Do they have a combination of guys that can slow and be down in Gasol and Serge Ibaka, or is that asking too much for those two guys to be able to do that <laughs> I, I'd say in this series? I put this to you, Seku. Are there a combination of guys <laughs> that can slow down and be? Horford and, and Beans. Is... Horford and Beans. I'll tell you that. Like they, that's right. the one. Although, yeah. although the last Sixers Celtics matchup, uh, Embiid had a huge game actually. Yeah. But that was that. That's well, been the combination in the past. Yeah. This is. Uh, these are Embiid's numbers against Gasol over the last two seasons, mm -hmm. and they played twice. Uh, this is obviously when Gasol was in Memphis. Mm -hmm. Embiid was 10 of 29, 0 of 9 from 3 with 9 turnovers. Wow. So that's over about 180 possessions. Yeah, I watched so some – I watched – I'm going to interrupt you again. I watched some of the sort of the uh, Sixers-Memphis film from earlier mm -hmm. in the season. When I saw those numbers, I was like, oh, look at this. Um, and it's just like he doesn't get the ball in the post enough. Like you would think, like oh, there's got to be a lot of post ups where Gasol shuts him down. It's like no, like he doesn't. And we saw it in the, we see it all the time. He doesn't catch the ball, and B does not catch the ball in the post very all that often compared to, uh, or relative to how dominant as opposed to every single possession, yeah. which is what he should when he should, <laughs> number yes. of times he should get it in the post. Yeah, exactly. If the Sixers are a properly constructed team. Yeah, but I think I think the point is like they. 
they're not going to double if, if Gasol is guarding him. And I think that's they're going to try to guard him one on one for probably. I think yeah, I would I would anticipate they'll definitely try. I think Gasol to answer Seiko's question, he's as well positioned as anyone in the league to try it. Mm-hmm. I mean, he kind of sort of matches Embiid physically. Of course, no one does. Right. He certainly um, would be his equal or more in terms of savvy, skill, maybe yeah. you know, kind of old school cleverness, mm-hmm. experience. And and I think the thing that Gasol, what I'll be really interested in is he is, you know, he's a big, big guy who defends like a little guy. And what I mean by that is, you know, he's, he, he, he bumps, he, he doesn't try to overpower guys. He just tries to off balance them. He, he, he sort of, he'll pull the chair on them. You know, he'll, he'll bump and leave. He won't let them feel him, you know, so he's, he's, and yet he's seven, one and 300. Right. right. So when the time comes, he can, you know, he's there. So, so I think it's a great matchup. It's a, going to be super fun to watch and be try and figure that one out. And if if John's right, if they're able to more or less cover him uh, one-on-one, it, it changes the face of the series. Yeah. Like the, I think the other question is on the other end of the floor, will Gasol be aggressive enough uh, shooting, especially from the perimeter, um, to draw Embiid away from the basket? Because Embiid in the Brooklyn series – when he played, his rim protection was fantastic. Like he was, sw- you know, like, you know, Brooklyn is trying to get downhill and get to the basket with Levert and Dinwiddie. Um, and if Embiid was there, he was mostly good in, in protecting the rim. And Brooklyn, um, aside from Jared Dudley, didn't have a guy who could play the five and then also shoot from the outside. Um, obviously Gasol is that guy. So I think, you know, he, he's not, he's, he's not been very aggressive shooting the ball with Toronto. Um, but I feel like he's going to have to be willing to shoot from the perimeter if Embiid is going to want to hang out in the paint. Right. And it, but he doesn't have to shoot a ton, John. And you know, he, you're right. He, it's been amazing to watch Gasol and how willing, probably more, maybe too willing to only facilitate offensively and, and not necessarily make teams, Pay, but you know I'm just looking at his numbers here in five games against um, against Orlando. Uh, he did shoot 54% from three on nearly three attempts, and he has been shooting the ball fantastic. Those above the break, the threes that are wide open, and you know the Raptors basically have played five out against Orlando with with Gasol as point center. And he both doubled his making, you know, kind of those quick little touch passes he makes that are often hockey assists and are the, you know, the ones he catch a guy's cutting below the rim. And more often than not, he was left wide open. He was a very, very dangerous shooter. So I think his, his overall, I, I would agree with you. I think it'd be a decent thing if his volume came up, but he is certainly uh, very confident right now from deep. And, you know, and I think that's, uh, that's almost like a, an ace in the hole the Raptors have because once, you know, once he, they do play five out, there's just too many guys who can put it on the floor and too many shooters on the floor, especially with their starting lineup. Um, or even, you know, even when they get, when they get into Van Bleed and, and, uh, Gasol and Norm Powell, the way he's been playing lately coming off the bench. So, so I think, I think you're right. It's a big key, but I do think Marc Gasol is the kind of player that can cause problems for, uh, and beat and, and so can Serge Ibaka. Yeah. Right, you brought. Uh, I'm sorry, so you brought up the bench. I'm going to say it. Are they going to play four reserves at one time in this series? Do you think, or are they going to be a little bit more conservative with their rotation? I, th- I think they 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 will be. I mean, they got away with it a little bit against. Um, and I say got away with it. I mean, it wasn't super effective, but they only went to that lineup a handful of times. You know, Jody Meeks was eighth in minutes, sorry, ninth in minutes, right. and he had 32 over five games. Right. So, you know, Jeremy Lin played 12. So, I mean, I think really you get to Norm Powell, who averaged, uh, you know, about 20, 19 minutes a game and played very well. And I think that's that's what you're going to see in terms of rotation. You might see Patrick McCaw, who didn't play, who came back off the injury list with a, with a thumb, didn't play at all in that series, will play two minutes. But 
I could see him just giving JJ Raddick or Jeremy Butler fit. Yeah. Like, I, I mean, you guys recall, he's just like Nick Nurse really, really likes him. So I could see them going a little deeper if they just want a defensive change of pace. Yeah. One of the guys who's been fascinating for me to watch this year is Siakam, as I know he has been for a lot of people. I'm curious, did you guys see, um, I know you, you watch him and he has, you know, highlight games, but, you know, performances earlier in his career where he looks really good, but you know, it's, it's not necessarily, well, that's not this guy's profile. This is not who he's going to be for the long term. When did it kind of hit that this guy was going to be a next level player like he's shown us this year? Like, did y'all see this last season or was it only this year where he really rounded into this kind of form? Because I, I'll be honest with you, I don't remember watching him the last year or so and thinking, man, this Siakam is going to be a, a monster. He's going to be a player. Then you watch him this year and like, I'm ready to put him on an all-star team. Look, you'd like to sit here and go, yeah, I, I, I knew it. I saw it. <laughs> you know, and as Nick Nurse said, um, anyone who said they saw this a year ago was lying. Okay, good. You know, they, they were, they, 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 there was, you could see that there, he was on a path. You could see he was improving. But I think his career playoff high in minutes last year was like 18 mm-hmm. or something. He was very much a role player. And if anything, his role got squeezed um, in tougher situations. And I, I, I will – say I, I I've always liked the kid mm-hmm. like from the first minute you saw him you go wow this is kind of interesting guy um but the, I guess the element of his game I didn't think last year you, you saw signs of him growing as a three-point shooter and and we've all seen that right if guys put in the work eventually that that catch and shoot corner three is something guys most guys can if they really want to it's almost like a litmus test yeah. right if you want to do make that shot as part of your arsenal you can and the guys who don't just generally haven't worked hard enough on it enough or smart enough. But the element of his game that has blown me away and and like you say, I mean, I put him third team all NBA is his ability to put the floor ball on the floor and create one on one in the half court and as he showed against Orlando, do it even against not full double teams, but definitely he was drawing that second defender and having to make decisions and and to do that against a really good defensive team, a really good defensive coach and do it effortlessly mm-hmm. was not something, uh, you know, I, I anticipated. And uh, it really changes the profile of this team is because we all know, right, when you look at the list of teams that win and win big, if you have two wings that can either command, com- both command and handle a double team, you know, that's a formula to win at the very, very highest level. Mm-hmm. And I'm not sure Pascal Siakam is quite there. But the way he's going, he might be there next week. <laughs> so it's it, it's changed the picture in a big way here in Toronto. It really has, and uh, it's 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 you know it's as much as people are excited about Kawhi Leonard for all the right reasons. You know the growth of Siakam is 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 kind of one A like, right alongside it. Yeah. yeah, I think the one thing it does maybe most significantly is it takes some of the pressure off Kyle Lowry to be the second offensive guy, right? Like if Lowry isn't shooting well on a particular night or if he's lost confidence in his shot and isn't aggressive enough with his shot, it's not, it's not as a big of a deal. If Siakam is having a, you know, putting up 25 or something like that and handling the ball and, and being aggressive, getting opportunities in transition. A hundred percent. No, it's changed. It's, it's a perfect time as well. I think uh, for that in Kyle's career is he's mature enough. Um, you know, he's in his 13th season, so he's very comfortable more than he's ever been in just being a pure facilitator. Uh, it obviously physically takes a load off of him, but it's now the, the wild card is, and we've all seen Lowry going, you know, when he's on a roll, he is just a hair below Dame Lillard, uh, Kawhi Lent, or sorry, uh, Steph Curry, uh, among the, the high usage point guards um, in, as, a, as a three-point shooter. You know, he's a little more streaky than those guys. But when he gets rolling, he's he's he can stay hot for a while. And, and if that version of Kyle Lowry emerges at any point just during this postseason, uh, look out. The Raptors will be very, very tough. Yeah. I, I don't want to jump the gun on the series because I think it's going to be fascinating, you know, to watch these two teams match up. And we've been – we've all been eyeballing the Eastern Conference semifinals since, what, like Christmas? You know, we, <laughs> exactly. we've all been talking about these potential November. matchups, like how – how good they could be. It was but, November. Like once the Bucks started the season like seven and one or whatever it was, I was like, okay, we have four really good teams right. in, in the East. So, you know? so we know. Oh, I guess it would be when when did when did Oladipo get hurt? That uh, was sort that's of true. A, that's true. Yeah. 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 
anyway, but yeah, we know the point that there, this, this is this is uh, this is we've, we're now in the big league, right? These, these so we, we got the big time matchups we're asking for, but each one of these teams t- to me has a different payoff depending on how they progress through the conference semifinals, what who gets to the conference finals, and who ultimately makes the finals. Toronto's to me, Mike, is the most finite in terms of we don't know what happens with Kawhi obviously beyond this moment, you know, beyond what does it take for him to seriously consider sticking around, you know, all of that stuff that will be decided in July for Masai Ujiri. What is the ultimate payoff here before we get to July 1st? Like, will will everybody be fine with the gamble he took in changing this team? If there's a conference finals trip, if there's a finals trip, like what, what level does this team have to achieve to to give Masai the cover he needs for for the risk he took? If if that makes sense to you, you no, know, that's a great question. I would say I'd answer it two ways. One is I don't think Masai needs a ton of cover. Mm-hmm. Like I think people, Demar Derozan was loved. Like, and that's not too far. Away. That's right. I'm not using the term lightly here in Toronto for all the right reasons. And it was painful when they traded him, but. It, people quickly understood the reasoning behind it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the fact that it's worked out quite well and you're here in the playoffs, if for whatever reason they don't get through the second round, I don't think anyone's going to be pointing a finger back at Masai, Masai Jury saying, why did you do this? Mm-hmm. I think a reasonable expectation, especially given the way uh, Milwaukee has emerged and, you know, I think Boston, most people still recognize as kind of a sleeping giant that may have just woke up. Um, if they get to a, for me personally, if they get to the Eastern Conference Final and you know show well there and can't can't break through for whatever reason, it's a it's a good year. It's it's it, it'll be a disappointing year because of what you could have done. But I, I think you know we'll see against the Sixers. But I think people are starting to look at the, at the conference, look at the team, look at the field, and go. Look, man, these things don't happen very often. There is a chance here to make an NBA final, maybe even win an NBA final. So if something if short of that happens, mm-hmm. it'll be more a case of a missed opportunity as opposed to a miscalculation. Right. It's just, it's just weird. I mean, I, I was thinking about it because before I didn't I didn't view the Warriors as vulnerable. Um, and then they st- and we talked about this earlier on the show. And then they started dropping home games and getting beat by twenty at Oracle. And I thought one of these these teams could get to the final even if it's the Warriors and win it. I, re- I truly believe that this year. And you start asking yourself, where does it mean the most? Like in Philly, where the process is at whatever stage it's at, in Boston, where things could change dramatically, you know, because of the decision Kyrie will make. And, and then you think about, you know, with the Raptors. I, I, just, I just think there's a huge opportunity for somebody to, to upset things in this playoffs. And it may come before that. It may be Houston that does it in the next round. But without the Warriors being as, as ironclad, bulletproof, you know, back to the finals again, as I thought they were, it, it makes me wonder if the ambitions and the calculations for all these other teams changes as well. I think it does. I mean, I mean, I was walking around this morning thinking, well, how would the Raptors match up with the Warriors? What would they do? <laughs> you know, it's um, – and I agree. I don't think there's any guarantee. In fact, I picked Houston to beat Golden State wow. and, and if Golden State gets there. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, but I still think Golden State is really the best team. I just think that they're vulnerable and – and this is the time that they might trip on their own two feet. But you're right. I think that's why the stakes are so high right now. I think this, you know, in, in previous years, certainly in Toronto, could they ever beat LeBron? Proves, uh, proves they couldn't. And did it even matter? Um, because we're, was anyone going to beat Golden State? Mm-hmm. And I think now you don't have to deal with LeBron, or although Giannis, I think, will cause problems. Um, and and But if you get across, you know, you can kind of go to that, NBA Finals and go, wait, I got a chance. Yeah. And I think that's what makes this uh, such a great and exciting playoff season in a lot of cities. Yeah. Eastern Conference Semifinals, like like you mentioned, shoot, we've been talking about them since Thanksgiving or whatever. And uh, now that they're here, <laughs> I'm kind of nervous. I'm, I don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> um, I'm ready. Great. We do, we do trivia every week here on the podcast. Schumann comes up with something that stumps myself and whoever our guest is, um, this is your turn to, to to beat him back by figuring out his trivia. So, Shu, what, what kind of Schumann stat do you have for us this week? Okay, so there are two active players 
that have played at least 20 playoff games for at least three different teams. 20 playoff Wow, okay. Three, wow. Okay. Uh, at least three different teams. One of them is still – both of them were on playoff teams this year. One hmm. of them has already been eliminated, and the other one is still alive and has advanced to the second round as we speak. Okay, so one of them is still alive. Okay. How many playoff uh, games? At least 20 playoff games at least for 20. at least three teams. One guy has done it for three teams. That's the guy that's still active uh, mm-hmm. and is still alive in the playoffs. Okay. Advanced to the second round. The other guy has played at least Who 20 William? playoff games for four different teams, oh, four? and he's just eliminated uh, recently. Good grief. Uh, in fact, okay. these two teams, these two guys played each other. I, in the I, first I'm going to, I'm going to plead uncle. Cause I, I do got to get in the car. and get going. <laughs> right. These but, guys, they played so each other in it. the Western conference first round. I'll give you that hint. No, I, I am, I am. I have no idea. Uh, literally my clock is ticking. Yeah. I got to roll. Tell answer, me what it is. All right. Give us the answer. Shoot. The answer is, uh, all right, here's, here's your one of them plays for the Rockets. Seiku, what's your, any guess? <sighs> Has played at least twenty playoff teams for different. Kenneth Farid. No. Yeah. I don't know. I have no idea. Chris Paul. Austin Rivers. Oh, Chris, Chris Paul. Paul. Yeah. Chris okay. Paul. Hornets, Clippers, Rockets, and the other one plays for the Utah Jazz. Four different teams. He's played uh, at least twenty playoff games for. Three of them in the Eastern Conference, and the Jazz is the other one. Hey, Crowder. No, except he did it. Uh, most of his Jazz playoff games came in a different stint. Uh, oh, Kyle Corver. Yeah. Kyle Corver, right. correct. Well, Utah, good. Chicago. All right, guys. All right. Fastest we've ever gotten the trivia. I'm the door. <laughs> Thank you. All right, guys. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye. Fastest we've ever got trivia. Thank God. <laughs> we appreciate Michael Grange of uh, Sportsnet in Toronto. He's got to get those winter tires flipped. Um, so we got to make sure we get him out the door for practice. But listen, tires flipped in April? Seriously? I'll let y'all have the North. I must, I must stay down here. Below the Mason Dixon, where I'm heading up there. I'm hoping there. it's uh, somewhat mild, relatively mild in the next. Uh, I'll, I'll be glad to show up there for the finals if that happens. I have no problem. I love Toronto, but I need it to be a lot warmer than that. I don't, I don't need anybody flipping tires when I'm up there for the finals. I've been up there a lot, and the only time it was somewhat nice was the conference finals. Um, <laughs> And I mean, so when I like, I can wear shorts out and, and that was the, uh, the only time. So hopefully, you know, it's not too bad for games one, two, five, and maybe seven, uh, in the next round. I hope we get some seven gamers in the conference semifinals on both sides. Um, We'll be back on Monday with another episode of Anytime Podcast. Game one start on Saturday. Make sure you follow all of our playoff coverage on NBA TV and NBA.com. Uh, be sure to subscribe to Hang Time on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts all season long. Don't forget to leave a review. We'll be around. We're, we're, we're not going anywhere, even though we're going to be on the road covering these series. I will be doing the Portland series and whoever they play, whether it's San Antonio or Denver Shoe. I know you're going to be locked in on what should be a fascinating, I mean, just straight up fascinating Philly, Toronto series. Steve Ashburn will be on Boston and uh, Milwaukee. And our main man, Sean Powell, the West Coast Bureau Chief, will be on the Warriors Rockets. So we'll have all that coverage for you on NBA.com, NBA TV as well. Or um, Clippers Rockets. Yeah, I'm sorry. That's right. <laughs> I just did, I just went Clay Thompson and, and looked right past the Clippers, didn't I? Don't get burned. Don't get burned. Hey, there's, that team's been known to blow a 3-1 lead. <laughs> we shall see. We'll see you right here next time on the Hang Time Podcast. Podcast.